Hi everyone, this is Amanda from Easy English Online. Thank you for joining me today. I'm really excited about this video as I've been talking about it for some time now. But first of all, if you're new to this channel, I've been teaching English to foreign students now for a number of years. If you would like to learn more or have one-to-one -one lessons with me, then click on the link below and that will give you a special deal on English lessons. So please check that out. So are you ready for this? Because we are going to start our eight week challenge mini course on the eight parts of speech. Today I'm going to give you a summary of all of the eight parts of speech and then there'll be a video each week which will go into each part in more detail. So let's dive straight in. Okay, so the eight parts of speech. In the English language, there are eight parts of speech. Nouns, pronouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, conjunctions, and interjections. Every word we use is a part of speech. Now, each part of speech indicates how the word is used in a sentence. It's a category of words which have similar grammatical properties. A single word can function as more than one part of speech in different situations. So let's look at the different types of speech in more detail. Let's start with nouns. A noun is a word which identifies a person, a place, a thing, an idea, or names of one of them. For example, a girl, a boy, a dog, Peter, town, London, book. A noun is often used with an article, so a, an, or the, but not always. Proper nouns start with a capital letter like for example, Peter or London, and common nouns do not. They can be singular or plural, concrete or abstract. This may sound a little complicated, but really it isn't. Please see my next video in the series for more details on nouns. Now the next part of speech that we're going to look at are pronouns. Do you remember what pronouns are? A pronoun is a word that is used instead of a noun or a noun phrase. They refer to a thing that has already been mentioned previously or to a noun that does not need to be named specifically. For example, I, you, me, he, she, herself, himself, it, that, they, or someone, etc. In this sentence, Peter saw Mary and he called out to her. The pronouns he and her take the place of the nouns Peter and Mary. Otherwise, we would be saying Peter saw Mary and Peter called out to Mary. This sounds a bit of a mouthful. So using he and her sounds much more natural to a native speaker. Peter saw Mary and he called out to her. Now our next part of speech that we're going to look at are verbs. What are verbs? A verb can be thought of as a doing word. It can be used to describe an action that's doing something. For example, to jump, to sing or to laugh. Verbs can also be used to describe a state of being or a feeling. For example, to like, to love, to hate. Or a verb can be used to describe an occurrence. That's something that's happening. For example, the word became. The caterpillar became a butterfly. Or verbs like to happen or to present. There are many more types of verbs, such as main verbs, auxiliary verbs, model verbs, etc. Please see my video on verbs to understand these in more detail. 
Now the next part of speech that we're going to look at are adjectives. An adjective, of course, describes or modifies a noun or a pronoun. It describes a person, a place or a thing. It tells us more about it. It gives us more information. For example, the little girl was hungry. The cake was delicious. Adjectives can also complement linking verbs or the verb to be. For example, it smells gross in the locker room. Driving is faster than walking. Adjectives can tell you how many of something you're talking about too, like two red roses. Two and red are adjectives that are modifying the roses. Now adjectives also come in different forms, absolute, comparative, superlative. I discuss these in more detail in another video. Now let's look at adverbs. Do you remember what adverbs are? So an adverb describes or modifies a verb, an adjective or another adverb. It tells us how often, where or when something happens. For example, fast, easily, completely, never, last year. A lot of adverbs end in ly. For example, slowly, quickly, cheerfully. So he, he moves slowly in the morning. Slowly here tells us how something happens. Slowly is an adverb of manner. Mary cheerfully greeted her parents yesterday. Here we have two adverbs. Cheerfully is an adverb of manner and yesterday is an adverb of time. The most common types of adverbs are adverbs of manner, frequency, place, time and degree. Adverbs of manner tell us how something is done. It's done quietly, it's done noisily. Adverbs of frequency tell us how often something is done. For example, always, never. Adverbs of place tell us where something happens. For example, inside the house, above the shelf. Adverbs of time tell us when something happens. For example, today, tomorrow, soon. And adverbs of degree tells us to what extent something happens. For example, really cold, so excited, very cruel. Okay, so now let's have a quick look at prepositions. What is a preposition? A preposition shows the relationship of a noun, a noun phrase or a pronoun to another word. For example, on, in, at, from, about, for, with. I left some dinner in the fridge for you to have later. There are many types of prepositions. For example, prepositions of time, place, movement, manner, etc. This is a massive topic, so please see my other video on this for more detail. Now for our next part of speech, conjunctions. Do you remember what conjunctions are? Okay, so a conjunction joins words, ideas, phrases or clauses together in a sentence and shows how they are connected. Conjunctions allow you to form more complex, elegant sentences and helps you to avoid a series of short, simplistic ones like I like cooking, I like eating, etc. Some examples of conjunctions are because, until, and, but, if, 
So therefore, since, and there are many others. So let's have a look at a sentence with conjunctions in. I was cold and hungry, but I still kept walking. Here we have two conjunctions, and and but. And shows that I felt both cold and hungry together. And but joins the first clause to the second and shows contrast. Okay, on to our next part of speech. Interjections. What are interjections? An interjection is a word or a phrase that expresses a strong feeling or emotion. It's usually said in a short exclamation. For example, wow, yuck, ouch. Wow, that's amazing. Yuck, that looks awful. Ouch, I've dropped the brick on my foot. Now it is important to note that a word can sometimes be more than one part of speech depending on its function. For example, the price of petrol increased last year. Here, increased is a verb. There was an increase in the number of followers on my YouTube channel. Here, increase is a noun. Well, that's it for today's video. So you've just heard a brief summary on the eight parts of speech. And next week, we'll be talking about nouns. So don't forget to press both of those like and subscribe buttons below so you get notified when the next video is released. As always, to accompany this video, I've prepared some notes which you can download. So if that interests you, please just click on the link below and you can download it straight away. See you next time. So today we're going to continue with our eight week challenge on the eight parts of speech. And we're going to talk about the very first part, which is nouns. So let's dive straight in. Nouns are everywhere. We use them all the time. But what are they and how do we use them? A noun is a word that names something like a book or a person, John Smith an animal, a dog, a place like London, a quality of something, softness, an idea like justice, or an action like singing. It is usually a single word, but not always. So like coat, shoes, or school bus. Now we have proper nouns, and common nouns. One important thing to decide first is whether a noun is a proper noun or a common noun. A proper noun is a specific name of a person, place or thing and is always capitalised. What time will Jack come home from work this evening? Jack is the name of a specific person. I would like to visit the Taj Mahal. Taj Mahal is the specific name of a place. A common noun is a generic name for a person, place or thing in a, in a class or a group. Unlike proper nouns, they're not capitalised unless it's at the beginning of a sentence. I saw a man with a dog walking towards the town. Note that we don't know exactly which man, town or dog that we're referring to. Now we also have countable versus uncountable nouns. Countable nouns or count nouns are nouns that can be counted. They have a singular and a plural form. They can be used with a number before, like three apples, five bananas, 
two oranges or with an article before a an or the so an apple a banana an orange other examples are bike umbrella horse and shop now Uncountable nouns are nouns that cannot be counted. For example, rain. You can't count rain, so it's an uncountable noun. Sugar. You can't count sugar. Rice. Again, you can't count rice. Well, you could try, but it would take you a ridiculous amount of time. Air. Water. Blood. Advice, happiness, which is an abstract idea. They usually do not have a plural form. We tend to use some with uncountable nouns in positive sentences and any with negative. There is some milk in the fridge. There isn't any tea. Now, concrete nouns. Concrete nouns are sometimes known as material nouns and they refer to people or things that exist physically and that at least one of the senses can detect. This means you can see, taste, hear, touch or smell it. Some examples are a tiger. You can see it, you can hear it or touch it. A lemon. You can taste it or touch it. Flower, you can smell it or see it. A newspaper, you can touch it. And now for abstract nouns. Abstract nouns are the opposite of concrete nouns. They refer to ideas that have no physical existence, like emotions, ideas and concepts that you can't see taste, hear, touch or smell. Some examples are love, we can't touch it or see it, we feel it. Time, you can't touch it or taste it. Luxury, generosity, worry, disregard, peace. Now for compound nouns. Compound nouns are nouns that are created with two or more words. So it can be a noun and a noun, or an adjective and a noun, or many other combinations. Each compound noun acts as a single unit and can be modified by adjectives and other nouns too. Compound nouns have three forms, so they can be hyphenated, like six pack, it can be spaced, like swimming pool, or closed, like bedroom. Some more examples are credit card, they're separate words. Daughter-in-law, so this is joined with hyphens. And football, which is closed. Now we also have collective nouns. A collective noun is the word used to represent a group of people, animals or things. It's the name of a group of things. For example, a flock of seagulls, a crowd of people, a fleet of ships, or a galaxy of stars. Now, it's important to note that sometimes things can be more than one noun. For example, a toothbrush. This is a common noun. It is the general name of the type of thing. So a concrete noun, you can touch and see it. It's a countable noun, one toothbrush, two toothbrushes. And it's a compound noun, tooth plus brush equals toothbrush. Well, that's it. So now you know about nouns. And next week, we'll talk all about pronouns. So don't forget to press both of those like and subscribe buttons below 
so you get notified when the next video is released. As always, to accompany this video, I've prepared some notes which you can download, so you just need to click on the link below in the description box and you can download it straight away. See you next time. So today we're going to continue with our eight week challenge on the eight parts of speech. And we're going to talk about pronouns. So let's dive straight in. So what are pronouns? A pronoun is a word that takes the place of a noun. For example, I, me, he, she, herself, himself, you, it, that, and many more. So if we look at this sentence, Peter called to Mary and he waved at her. The pronouns he and her take the place of Peter and Mary, respectively. So let's take a closer look at the different types of pronouns, starting with subject pronouns. A subject pronoun is exactly what it sounds like a pronoun that takes the place of a noun as the subject of the sentence. They are those pronouns that perform the action in the sentence. For example, I, he, she, they, who, these are all subject pronouns. Some examples are he washed the dishes, they played the piano. Subject pronouns are also sometimes used to rename the subject. They can follow to be verbs, such as is, are, was, am, will be, etc. For example, it is she. This is he speaking. So now let's look at object pronouns. What are these? Object pronouns are pronouns that receive the action in a sentence. So some examples of these are me, him, himself, us, them. So with the odd exception, an object pronoun comes after a verb. So for example, my father feeds them every morning. The dentist told you to open your mouth. The waitress brought her a sandwich. So now let's look at possessive pronouns. What are these? Possessive pronouns show that something belongs to someone. The possessive pronouns are my, our, your, his, her, its and their. There's also an independent form of each of these pronouns which are mine, ours, yours, his, hers, and theirs. Now, another thing to remember is that possessive pronouns, yours, his, hers, its, ours, theirs, and whose, do not need an apostrophe. Try not to make mistakes like hers or yours. For example, it is incorrect to say Jane takes pride in Jane's outfits. This sounds a little odd. It would be more correct to say, Jane takes pride in her outfits. Note that it has an apostrophe only when it is a contraction for it is or it has. The only time whose has an apostrophe is when it means who is or who has. For example, it's been a hot day. Well, he's the one who's always late everywhere he goes. Okay, so let's look at possessive adjectives. What is a possessive adjective and when do we use it? A possessive adjective is an adjective that is also used to show ownership, but it comes before a noun in a sentence and lets us know to whom the noun belongs. For example, my, your, his, her, its, our, and their. Now be careful not to confuse these possessive adjectives with possessive pronouns. 
A possessive pronoun shows ownership, but it does not come before a noun or in a noun phrase. It stands alone. Remember, they are used to replace the noun. So simply put, possessive pronouns are used to replace the noun and possessive adjectives are used to describe the noun. So now let's look at reflexive pronouns. Reflexive pronouns are pronouns that end in self or selves. There are nine reflexive pronouns. Myself, yourself, himself, herself, itself, oneself, ourselves, yourselves and themselves. They are used when both the subject and the object of a verb are the same person or thing. For example, Mary helped herself. Okay, so here we have a table showing the different types of pronouns. It shows the subject pronouns, the object pronouns, possessive adjectives, possessive pronouns, and the reflexive pronouns. So please take a look at this in your own time. Now let's look at demonstrative pronouns. What are these, do you think? Demonstrative pronouns are this, that, these and those, which refer to things. This and these refer to things that are near, and that and those refer to things that are further away. For example, this is my car. That is our house over there. These are my books on the desk. Those are beautiful flowers in that field. Now finally, let's look at interrogative pronouns. Interrogative pronouns are used in questions. The interrogative pronouns are who, what, which, whom, and whose. For example, who wants a big bar of chocolate? What is your name? Which movie do you want to watch? Whom did you speak to? And whose coat is this? Well, that's it. So now you know all about pronouns. And next week, we're going to talk all about adjectives. Don't forget to press both of those like and subscribe buttons below so you get notified when the next video is released. As always, to accompany this video, I've prepared some notes which you can download. So you just need to click on the link below in the description box and you can download it straight away. See you next time. So today we're going to continue with our eight week challenge on the eight parts of speech. And we're going to talk about verbs. So let's dive straight in. Okay, so what is a verb? A verb is a word used to describe an action, a state or an occurrence. Verbs can be used to describe an action that's doing something. For example, like the word jumping in this sentence. The dog was jumping at the gate. They can also be used to describe a state of being that's feeling something. For example, the word likes here. The boy likes motorbikes. A verb can also be used to describe an occurrence. That's something that's happening. For example, the word became in this sentence. So the caterpillar became a butterfly. When writing, make sure every sentence includes a verb. Verbs can be conjugated and have tenses. So we have the present tense to indicate that an action is being carried out. The past tense to indicate that an action has been done. And we have the future tense to indicate that an action will be done. Okay, so let's look at dynamic action verbs, a non-stative verb. 
Most verbs describe a physical action or activity, something that can be seen or heard. For example, play, walk, run, sing, dance, sleep. There are a lot of verbs that we do that we can't see. These are verbs that perhaps take place in our minds or they are feelings that we have. These are dynamic verbs, but they're not so obvious. These include process verbs, which describe actions of transition. For example, succeed, fail, consider, guess, or grow. Okay, so let's look at stative verbs now. These are the opposite of dynamic verbs. Static verbs describe a subject's state or feeling, including things they like and don't like. They can relate to thoughts and opinions, feelings or emotions, senses and perceptions, or possession and measurement. Some examples of static verbs are love, hate, like, want, need, agree, guess, hear, look, have, and belong, etc. One important thing to remember is that stative verbs can't be used in the continuous tense. They are usually in the simple tenses or occasionally the perfect tense. Now let's look at verbs that can be dynamic or stative. A lot of verbs have more than one meaning. So they can be used as dynamic or stative. These include perception words like see, hear, taste, smell, and feel. When perception verbs are used as an involuntary action, they are stative. So when those same verbs are used for a voluntary action, something that you do specifically or deliberately out of your own choice, then they are dynamic. One way of knowing if a verb is used as a dynamic verb or a stative verb is to consider the tense being used. So as I mentioned before, stative verbs can't be used in the continuous tense. So let's look at some examples. It looks like it might be a sunny day. So looks here is stative. It's involuntary. No one is actively looking. It just appears to be a sunny day. Amanda is looking for her keys. So looking here is dynamic. It is voluntary because Amanda is actually looking or searching for her keys. I have a small garden. So this is stative, involuntary. I'm having lunch. This is dynamic, voluntary. I think this weather is awful. So here it's stative, involuntary. I'm thinking of having a haircut. So this is dynamic, this is voluntary. Okay, so let's look at auxiliary verbs. These are helping verbs. An auxiliary verb is used with a main verb to help express the main verb's tense, mood or voice. The main auxiliary verbs are be, have and do. So as a reminder, to be, for instance, am, is, are, was, were, being, been, will be. Or to have, for example, has, have, had, having, will have, and to do, does, do, did, will do. For example, that piece of chicken was eaten by me. I have eaten sushi many times before. Did you like the music? Okay, so let's look at modal auxiliary verbs. Modal auxiliary verbs 
otherwise known as modal verbs or even just modals, are added to another verb to show necessity, possibility or capability. Modal auxiliary verbs are not the main verb, but they do change its meaning slightly. Examples are shall, should, can, could, will, would, must, might, or may. I could buy this dress, but should I? It's really expensive. You must buy a dress for the wedding, but this one might not be appropriate. OK, so now let's look at phrasal verbs. Phrasal verbs are phrases that indicate actions. They are generally used in spoken English and informal texts. Phrasal verbs act as individual verbs, often combining two or more words and changing their meaning. The verb get, for example, becomes many different phrasal verbs when combined with different prepositions. For example, I've been getting along really well in my new job. Is there any way of getting around the rules so we can bring our dog into the country? She keeps getting at me for every little thing. I can't do anything right. OK, so now let's look at transitive verbs and intransitive verbs. A transitive verb is a verb that can take a direct object. In other words, the action of a transitive verb is done to someone or something. Most verbs are transitive. For example, clean, like, love, dislike, hate, want, bought. Here are some more examples. Peter loves mince pies. Loves is transitive because you can love something. Mary bought dozens of cakes. Bought is transitive because you can buy something. An intransitive verb is a verb that does not take a direct object. In other words, it is not done to someone or something. It only involves the subject. For example, go, walk, run, talk, sit, faint, saw. He fainted. Fainted is an intransitive verb. It is no direct object. You can't faint something. A vulture soared effortlessly overhead. Soared is an intransitive verb. It is no direct object. You can't saw something. So let's look at active versus passive voice. In English, we can express sentences in two different ways. We can use the active voice and the passive voice. The active voice is used when the focus is on the subject of the main verb. This is the person or thing doing the verb. The dog chased the ball. I will clean the house every Saturday. The teacher always answers the students' questions. Now the passive voice is used when the person or the thing affected by the main verb becomes the focus. So the ball was chased by the dog. The house will be cleaned by me every Saturday. The students' questions are always answered by the teacher. OK, so regular versus irregular verbs. There are certain forms which a verb can take. These are infinitive, third person present, simple past, past participle and present participle. If you take a look at these forms, you'll notice that there are some verbs whose simple past and past participle have a set or fixed ending. These are called regular verbs. So please take a look at this table. There are certain verbs which either change their forms completely or remain the same. 
These are known as irregular verbs. So please take a look at this table for some examples. Note that sometimes the spelling doesn't change, but the pronunciation does. For example, read and read. There are many irregular verbs in English that I will look at more with you in another video. So when learning English, one of the first things every student should do is to try to learn to conjugate verbs in different tenses in order for their sentences to make sense. We will learn more about conjugating verbs in another video too. Well, that's it. So now you know about verbs. And next week, we're going to talk about adverbs. So don't forget to press both of those like and subscribe buttons below so you get notified when the next video is released. As always, to accompany this video, I've prepared some notes which you can download. So you just need to click on the link below in the description box and you can download it straight away. See you next time. So today we're going to continue with our eight week challenge on the eight parts of speech. And we're going to be talking about adjectives. So let's dive straight in. So adjectives, what are adjectives? So an adjective is a word that describes a noun or a pronoun and gives us more information about it. For example, it was terrible weather. The word terrible tells us what the weather was like. Spicy food has a strong, hot flavour. The words spicy, strong and hot tell us about the food and of course its flavour. So where do adjectives go in a sentence? Most adjectives can be used in front of a noun. So it was a very beautiful castle. We saw a very exciting film last night. Or an adjective can be used after a link verb, like be, look, or feel. For example, this countryside is beautiful. That documentary looks interesting. Now, a lot of adjectives are made from verbs by adding ing or ed. Usually, ing adjectives show the effect which something has on a person or thing. So here are some examples of ing adjectives. Interesting, terrifying, surprising, annoying, tiring, boring, amusing. We can say, I read a very interesting article in a magazine today. If you say something is interesting, it means that it interests you. That horror film was absolutely terrifying. So if you say something is terrifying, it means it terrifies you. Now, ED adjectives. These show what has happened to a person or thing. For example, amazed, bored, horrified, annoyed, confused, delighted, terrified. So let's look at a couple of sentences. We had nothing to do today. We were really bored. So if something bores you, you can say you feel bored. I didn't really enjoy the Dracula film. Most of the time I was terrified. If something terrifies you, you can say you are terrified. So now let's look at the adjective order in English. In English, we often have two or more adjectives in front of a noun. For instance, you can say a beautiful young woman or a small blue car, that scary big dog. Did you know in the English language, there's an, a proper order for adjectives? This is the usual order that we should try to use them. We should start with the quantity of something. We say one, two, three. Then your opinion, 
so delicious, lovely, strange, misunderstood. Then the size, so big, small, tiny, huge. Then the age of something or someone, so it's old or new, etc. Then the shape, so it's round, square, and so on. Then the color, blue, green, red, black, etc. Then the origin or the material, so it's, it's British, it's glass, French. Then the qualifier, for instance, it's a denim skirt, a vampire bat. And finally, the purpose, like mixing, drinking and cooking. Although you might not ever have seen a list like this, you may have picked up on it and use it without even realizing it. So here are some examples. I carried a very small black suitcase. That is a really ugly wooden chair. I love that really big old green antique car that always parked at the end of the street. Okay, so now we're going to look at comparative and superlative adjectives. What are these? Any ideas? So let's start with comparative adjectives. We use comparative adjectives to show change or make comparisons. They enable us to say whether a person or thing has more or less of a particular quality. We can also use them to compare one thing with another. So Craig is shorter than his brother. Your dog runs faster than Mike's dog. My house is smaller than his. OK, now for superlative adjectives. Superlative adjectives describe one person or thing as having more of a quality than all other people or things in a group. It describes something as being of the highest or the lowest degree or extreme. For example, best, worst, largest. So Susan owned the finest restaurant in the city. Paul was the worst footballer in the team. I will explain more on how to form comparative and superlative adjectives in a separate video. OK, so now for intensifiers. Do you know what intensifiers are and when do we use them? Often when we speak, we use words like very, really, extremely to make adjectives sound stronger. These words are called intensifiers. So let's look at intensifiers in a sentence. It's a very interesting program. The children were very excited. It was a really interesting conversation. Everyone was extremely excited. Other popular intensifiers are incredibly, particularly, highly, so, to, and there are many, many more. OK, so finally, we're going to look at mitigators. What are mitigators? Mitigators are, of course, the opposite of intensifiers. We use these words when we want to make an adjective sound less strong. For example, words like fairly, rather, quite, slightly, a little, etc. So let's look at these in a sentence. The movie was rather dull. The runner performed fairly well, but not well enough to win the race. And they were all a little bit annoyed that the concert had been cancelled. Well, that's it. So now you know about adjectives. And next week, we're going to talk all about verbs. So don't forget to press both of those like and subscribe buttons below so you get notified when the next video is released. As always, to accompany this video, I've prepared some notes, which you can download. So you just need to click on the link below in the description box and you can download it straight away. See you next time.
So today we're going to continue with our eight-week challenge on the eight parts of speech and we're going to talk about adverbs. So let's dive straight in. Okay, so adverbs. What is an adverb? An adverb is a word that describes a verb, an adjective, another adverb or even a whole sentence. Let's go straight into some examples which will give you a clearer idea. So, Peter did not sing badly. Peter did not sing badly. Here, the adverb is describing the verb sing. Lisa is very quiet. Lisa is very quiet. The adverb in this sentence is, of course, describing an adjective. The race finished too quickly. The race finished too quickly. Here, the adverb describes another adverb, quickly. Fortunately, Katie recorded Adam's win. Fortunately, Katie recorded Adam's win. Here, the adverb describes the whole sentence. So we've established that adverbs often modify verbs. They describe verbs. This means they describe the way an action is happening. So, the dog barks loudly in the street. The dog barks loudly in the street. My cat waits impatiently for his food. My cat waits impatiently for his food. In these sentences, we can now see the way the action is happening, but loudly and impatiently. Adverbs can also tell us how an action was performed. So badly, peacefully, carefully, they can also tell you when and where it happened too. So we arrived early. We arrived early. Or turn here. Turn here. So now there is something important that we must note when it comes to linking verbs. Linking verbs are of course verbs like appear, become, feel, seem, smell, sound, stay or taste. These verbs are often followed by adjectives instead of adverbs. In these sentences, the adjective describes the subject of the sentence and not the verb, which is why an adverb is not possible. So look at these sentences. Karen seemed tired. Karen seemed tired, not tiredly. Max seemed angry. Max seemed angry. The wine tastes fine. The wine tastes fine. Okay, so let's look at adverbs with adjectives now. As I said, adverbs can modify adjectives and other adverbs too. Often the reason for the adverb is to add a degree of intensity to the adjective. So the dog is quite aggressive. The dog is quite aggressive. The word quite is used here to emphasize how aggressive the dog is. This book is more interesting than the last one. This book is more interesting than the last one. The weather forecast is almost always wrong. The weather forecast is almost always wrong. The adverb almost is modifying the adverb always, and they're both modifying the word wrong. Is my music too loud? asked Craig. Is my music too loud? asked Craig. My children are incredibly happy to see their father again. My children are incredibly happy to see their father again. I will be slightly late to the party. I will be slightly late to the party. 
Okay, so now let's look at adverbs used with other adverbs. So as we now know, an adverb can be used to describe another adverb. Chris can discuss the English language very thoroughly. Chris can discuss the English language very thoroughly. The adverb very modifies the adverb thoroughly by telling us to what degree. There are some adverbs that can modify entire sentences too. These are called sentence adverbs. They express the person's attitude to the content of the sentence or it places the sentence in a particular context, like technically or politically. Sentence adverbs don't describe one particular thing in the sentence. Instead, they describe a general feeling about all of the information in the sentence. For instance, some commonly used examples are words like generally, fortunately, interestingly, and accordingly. So we would say, fortunately, we got there just before the meeting started. Fortunately, we got there just before the meeting started. Interestingly, no one at the auction seemed interested in bidding on the antique spoon collection. Interestingly, no one at the auction seemed interested in bidding on the antique spoon collection. Okay, so now we're going to think about the placement of adverbs. Whereabouts do we put them in a sentence to sound natural? It is best to try to place adverbs as close as possible to the words they are modifying. So putting the adverb in the wrong place can make a sentence sound awkward or sometimes, unfortunately, it can change the whole meaning of the sentence. Be extra careful about the word only, too, which is one of the most often misplaced modifiers. Look at the difference between these two sentences. Harry only fed the dog. Harry fed only the dog. The first sentence means that all Harry did was feed the dog. He didn't pet the dog or pick it up or anything else. And in the second sentence, it means that Harry fed the dog, but he didn't feed the cat, the bird or anyone else who may have been around. Now let's look at the placement of adverbs. When an adverb is modifying a verb phrase, the most natural place for the adverb is usually in the middle of the phrase. We are quickly approaching the end of the road. We are quickly approaching the end of the road. Max has always loved skateboarding. Max has always loved skateboarding. I will happily assist you. I will happily assist you. Well, that's it. So now you know about adverbs. And next week we will talk about prepositions. Don't forget to press both of those like and subscribe buttons below so you get notified when the next video is released. As always, to accompany this video, I prepared some notes which you can download. So you just need to click on the link below in the description box and you can download it straight away. See you next time. Hi everyone, thank you for joining me. If you're new to this channel, my name is Amanda. I've been teaching English to foreign students now for a number of years. If you would like to learn more or have one-to-one -one lessons with me, then I've provided a link in the description box below that will give you a special deal on English lessons. So please check that out. So today we're going to continue with our eight week challenge on the eight parts of speech. And we're going to talk about prepositions. So let's dive straight in. Watch out, there's a shark. Where? Behind you. Oh, thank goodness for prepositions. Can you imagine not knowing where the danger lay? So prepositions tell us when or where something is in relation to something else. 
When a shark is approaching, it's good to have these special words to tell us where those scary creatures are. Are they behind us or in front of us? Will it eat me in five seconds or in two minutes? Prepositions often tell us where one noun is in relation to another. So the book is on the shelf beside you. The book is on the shelf beside you. They can also indicate more abstract ideas, such as purpose or contrast. So I went out for a run despite the rain. I went out for a run despite the rain. Prepositions are small and can be a tricky area of grammar to master. Because they're usually small, many of my students find them easy to forget or they just leave them out altogether. Unfortunately, there's no formula for them and each preposition and use just needs to be learned. There are around 150 prepositions and you can find plenty of lists of these on the internet. We use prepositions more frequently than any other individual word, so it's worth putting in the effort. So some of the most commonly used ones that you may already know are above, below, underneath, between, near, to, of, despite, just to name a few. Now we commonly use prepositions to show the relationship in space or time between two or more people, places or things. They're most commonly followed by a noun phrase or a pronoun. For example, the last time I saw her, she was jogging down the street. The last time I saw her, she was jogging down the street. I'll meet you in the small restaurant opposite the opera house. I'll meet you in the small restaurant opposite the opera house. It was the worst hurricane in Britain since the 90s. It was the worst hurricane in Britain since the 90s. Give that to me. Give that to me. Now there are five types of prepositions. You have simple prepositions, double prepositions, compound prepositions, participle prepositions and phrase prepositions. So let's start with simple prepositions. These are common prepositions used to describe a location, time or place. These are words like at, for, in, off, on, over and under, etc. So you could say the little boy sat on the wall. The little boy sat on the wall. The cat was hiding under the table. The cat was hiding under the table. She lives near her workplace. She lives near her workplace. OK, so now let's look at double prepositions. A double preposition is made by combining two simple prepositions together. These prepositions often indicate direction. So these are words like into, upon, onto, out of, etc. For example, once upon a time there was a handsome prince. Once upon a time there was a handsome prince. The puppy climbed onto my lap. The puppy climbed onto my lap. He would never leave the house without his mobile phone. He would never leave the house without his mobile phone. OK, so next we have compound prepositions. Do you know what these are? Compound prepositions are made up with the combination of a non-prepositional word and a simple preposition. Some examples of compound prepositions are, for instance, Mary sat across from Christopher. Mary sat across from Christopher. Tom will be taking the lead part in the show in place of Peter. Tom will be taking the lead part in the show in place of Peter. In addition to getting soaked through, the little boy was covered in mud. 
In addition to getting soaked through, the little boy was covered in mud. Okay, now for participle prepositions. What are these? Participle prepositions have endings such as ed and ing. Here the words act as a verb as well as a preposition. Words like considering, provided, following, including, etc. Let's look at participle prepositions in a sentence. So the dog kept following him all the way home. The dog kept following him all the way home. Every detail regarding the meeting was true. Every detail regarding the meeting was true. You will succeed provided that you work hard. You will succeed provided that you work hard. Okay, and finally we have prepositional phrases. So what are these? A prepositional phrase, simply put, consists of one preposition and its object. It can also include, if necessary, any word that modifies the object. The object can be a noun, a pronoun, a gerund, which is a verb ending in ing that acts as a noun, or a clause. For example, a town near London. A town near London. He acts without thinking. He acts without thinking. It's a present from her. It's a present from her. Is she really going out with that guy? Is she really going out with that guy? Prepositional phrases function as either adjectives modifying nouns or adverbs modifying verbs. So first of all, let's look at examples of prepositional phrases functioning as an adjective modifying a noun. Do you mean the plant in the corner? Do you mean the plant in the corner? I know the policeman with the radio. I know the policeman with the radio. Here, the prepositional phrases are functioning as adjectives. They are modifying the nouns, the plant and the policeman. Now let's look at some examples of prepositional phrases functioning as an adverb modifying a verb. For instance, I live near the park. I live near the park. He speaks with great enthusiasm. He speaks with great enthusiasm. Here, the prepositional phrases are acting as adverbs modifying the verbs live and speaks. As I said before, prepositions can be a tricky area for students to get their heads around. It just takes a bit of practice. I've actually done another separate video on prepositions of time and place which you may find useful with lots of examples. So please watch that one too for more detail on that. Well, that's it. So now you know about prepositions. And next week we will talk about conjunctions. Don't forget to press both of those like and subscribe buttons below so you get notified when the next video is released. As always, to accompany this video, I've prepared some notes which you can download so you just need to click on the link below in the description box and you can download it straight away. See you next time. Hi everyone, thank you for joining me. If you're new to this channel, my name is Amanda. I have been teaching English to foreign students now for a number of years. If you would like to learn more or have one-to-one -one lessons with me, then I've provided a link in the description box below that will give you a special deal on English lessons. So please check that out. So today we're going to continue with our eight-week challenge on the eight parts of speech. And we're going to talk about conjunctions. So let's dive straight in. 
OK, so what are conjunctions? Conjunctions are words used to connect words, phrases or clauses together. They link thoughts and ideas in a sentence. You might think of them as the glue of a phrase. If we didn't have conjunction words, we'd be forced to express ourselves in a series of short, simplistic sentences like, I like running, I like swimming, I don't like cycling. Instead, conjunction words allow us to create much longer, more complex sentences, which help us to express ourselves better. Using conjunctions, we could simply say, I like running and swimming, but I don't like cycling. Now, as I said, conjunctions link sentences and ideas together. This helps the text to flow more naturally. So how do they work in a sentence? Let's start by looking at this little word, so. This little conjunction links two ideas. One idea follows on as a result or consequence of another one. For example, he was tired, so he went to bed. It was a long journey, so I'm really tired now. Another little word that we use a lot is and. This conjunction links together ideas or actions that are similar in a sentence. For instance, she didn't speak to anyone and nobody spoke to her. You cook the lunch and I'll look after the children. OK, so another one is the conjunction while. Using while links an action with the time when it took place. I don't want you to drive while you're so tired. Someone called while you were out. Another little word we use a lot is but. This conjunction introduces a contrast, often indicating something you might expect to happen didn't. I want to go to the party, but I'm so tired. The park is empty now, but it will be filled with children after school. Now another conjunction we all use a lot is because. This conjunction introduces a reason for something. So he got food poisoning because of the undercooked chicken. I don't like him because he is mean. Now there are three types of conjunctions, coordinating conjunctions, subordinating conjunctions, and correlative conjunctions. I wonder if you know the differences here and how to use them in a sentence. Don't worry, we're going to go through it all now, starting with coordinating conjunctions. So coordinating conjunctions join like with like. For example, they join a noun with another noun, or an adjective with another adjective. They are used to link together two parts of a sentence that are both of equal importance. There are seven coordinating conjunctions in total, for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. So here are some examples of coordinating conjunctions being used in a sentence. I brushed my teeth and went to bed. Would you prefer coffee or tea? Neither he nor I will be there. So now let's look at subordinating conjunctions. A subordinating conjunction is simply the word that is used to join the subordinating clause to another clause or sentence. It also introduces the subordinate clause in a sentence. Remember, a subordinating clause is part of a sentence that adds additional information to the main clause. It doesn't make sense on its own. Okay, so first let's take a look at these two sentences. He was annoyed the train had stopped and he was annoyed because the train had stopped. By adding because, 
We are linking the subordinating clause. The train had stopped. With the main clause, he was annoyed. OK, so some more examples are, I can't go out and sunbathe, although I would love to. Make sure you turn off the oven if it gets too hot. Don't go in the sea until the waves calm down. So finally, let's look at correlative conjunctions. Correlative conjunctions are used in pairs to join alternatives or equal elements in a sentence. The most common pairs are either or, neither nor, and not only, but also. As I said, correlative conjunctions are used in pairs. These pairs work together to indicate a connection or a link between two subjects. They express details or provide clarity. They involve a first conjunction that connects to another part of the sentence with a second conjunction. Does this sound complicated? Let's look at some examples which will help to make better sense of it. So here are some common pairs of correlative conjunctions that may be used. Let's look at both and and. We'll have both the cheesecake and the chocolate cake, please. We can use either or. For example, you could say, my brother is either working upstairs or slacking off downstairs. Using either and or connects two positive statements of equal importance. We can also use neither nor. Oh, you want neither the sticky dessert nor the fruit salad. No problem. Using neither nor here connects two negative statements of equal importance. Another pair we can use is whether or. So whether or connects two possible actions of a sentence. For example, you could say, I don't know whether she will recognize me or not. We can use not only, but also. So he not only speaks English, but also French. And another pair is rather and than. For example, you could say, I would rather have coffee than tea. Rather and than presents a subject's preference for one thing over another. Well, that's it. So now you know about conjunctions. And next week, we'll talk all about interjections. Don't forget to press both of those like and subscribe buttons below so you get notified when the next video is released. As always, to accompany this video, I've prepared some notes which you can download. So you just need to click on the link below in the description box and you can download it straight away. See you next time.